Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to try to answer a question I've been getting a lot over the past two or three years. Should I buy an 8-inch Dobsonian or a 10-inch Dobsonian? <laughs> so first of all, if you happen to just wander across this channel from YouTube land and wondering what the heck is going on here, well these are astronomical telescopes designed for looking up at the night sky. The purpose of a telescope is to gather light. In this case, this is the 8-inch version. There's a mirror in the back here. It deflects the light into this here. This is your focuser. This is how you focus. And this is the eyepiece. This is where you look. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. The mount is on something called a Dobsonian mount. It's a fancy word. All it means is the mount goes left and right and up and down. Named after San Francisco astronomer John Dobson, credited for popularizing its design. If you buy one of these, there is no need to purchase anything else, no additional amount, you just set this on the ground and start using it. Now a mid-aperture Dobsonian reflector is often cited as the ideal first telescope for a beginner, and it's not hard to see why. They are quite simple, they gather a lot of light, and perhaps most importantly, they're very cost effective. Okay, so I thought I'd go ahead and show this. These are actually quite simple devices. If we just undo the tensioner here, the tube lifts right off the base. There's only two pieces of the telescope. You put them in the car. I can very often be set up and observing in less than two minutes. And perhaps even more importantly, at the end of the evening, I can be back in my car and driving home in only a few minutes. So on the 10 inch here, it uses a slightly different tensioning system. This is a, just a screw here like this. When you loosen these up, it's got a nice handle, and this comes off. So the purpose of a telescope is to gather light. When we step outside, our eyes can only gather a certain amount of light. Somewhere around 7 millimeters or so is the maximum amount that our pupils will open. And that number actually gets smaller as we get older. So the function of a telescope here is to gather light for us. In this case, 8 inches here or 10 inches here. Telescopes are rated by their ability to gather light. Common apertures include 4 inch, 4.5 inch, 6 inch, 8 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, and so forth. The more aperture a telescope has, the dimmer the objects it can see. Because a larger telescope can see dimmer objects, your acquisition time very often is reduced. So it stands to reason that all other things being equal, you should always choose the telescope that has the larger aperture because it gathers more light. So in this case, that should be a simple decision here, right? We should always get the 10 inch. Should we? Well, the answer is an unqualified maybe. And for some people, the answer will actually be no. Let's take a look at why. Okay, so first of all, if you've reached this decision and you're trying to decide between one of these, you're already in a very good space. You're not going to go wrong buying either of these. You've navigated the minefield of the dreaded department store grade telescopes, and you found your way into a serious telescope. That's good. But I do have a very clear opinion as to which one of these most people should buy. Okay, now in a perfect world, everyone would just buy the 10 inch because it simply gathers more light. But in practical terms, there are some issues that come into play from real-world considerations that you might not have thought of. One of them is the weight. Obviously, this thing is going to weigh a little more, but it's not just the weight itself. Starting with the 10-inch, the weight of the optical tube starts to exert pressure on the azimuth axis. That's the axis that goes left and right. There's some sort of a tipping point when you go to, from the 8 to the 10 that this motion starts to get a lot stiffer. Keep in mind, when you're tracking this thing across the sky, stars move in an arc across the sky, and you're going to be tracking along both axes at the same time. So it stands to reason you want both axes to have about the same amount of friction. Starting with the 10, this axis here, this left-right, starts to get a little stiff, and it can interfere a little bit with your ability to track smoothly across the sky, especially at medium to high power. Now, there have been various solutions to this in the past. One of them is that some manufacturers will put a roller bearing, lazy Susan style bearing system on the base. Now, you're going to find some varying opinions here, but I don't like those things. The problem is it has the opposite issue. You've gone to a system where this is too stiff to one where it turns too easily. 
and you know that the manufacturers know it turns a little bit too easily because some of them will put a mechanical brake that rubs against the side of the ground board to slow things down. So, uh, you know, you've had gone from a motion that's too stiff, you've made it too easy to move, and then you're going back to stiffness by putting the brake in, you're just chasing your tail. Also, the ball bearing tends to make a little bit of noise, and some people don't like that. The brake doesn't exert an even amount of tension all the way around. Me, I just prefer it the old-fashioned way. Make this motion a little bit too stiff, and I'll just deal with it. The second issue with the 10-inch has nothing to do with the telescope itself. It has to do with you, the observer. Here's what I find. Over time, a 10-inch telescope gets used less than an 8-inch or a 6-inch. What happens is in the beginning, you'll use it in the beginning because it's exciting and it's new. But over time, if it's partly cloudy out or if you come home from work and you're tired, you might be slightly less motivated to take this thing out. My rule of thumb from observing people over the past 20 plus years, an, a 10 inch telescope gets used about half as often as an eight inch. The telescope that shows you the most is the telescope you use the most and sixes and eights tend to get used. Now, having observed people over the years, it's interesting. It doesn't seem to matter who you are. You could be a bodybuilder, you could be a weightlifter, you could be a little teenage girl. It's all the same. People tend to use 10 inch telescopes a little bit less. So my general conclusion is that while the eight inch sits in a nice spot for a solid tube Dobsonian design, the 10 inch starts to outgrow this design a little bit. Now there have been some remedial measures that people have taken to try to get around this. I had, for example, the Skywatcher version of this semi-truss tube design here in for review. Again, it's a semi-truss design and I gave it a semi-positive review. You can see that it eliminates a section of the tube and replaces it with truss poles. So here's the issue with that design. So first of all, it's fine. I recommend it. There's nothing wrong with it. So what you're doing is you're only getting rid of, depending on the model you get, somewhere between 12 and 16 inches of this solid tube here. Well, okay, but what does 12 to 16 inches worth of rolled steel here weigh? It actually doesn't weigh very much. And in fact, people will say that they're getting that to save weight. But if you look at the weight claims on these manufacturers, those semi-truss tube designs actually weigh a couple of pounds more than the solid tube versions. Another reason for getting the semi-truss design, I'm saving space. Yes, it does save space, but you're only saving that 12 to 16 inches and you're saving it in the vertical direction where most people don't have an issue. Where people have space issues, it's usually because of footprint and the footprint stays the same. You can actually store this thing in a closet like this. This will fit into most closets and if you have a little bit of problem with the vertical space here, you can take this off the tube and place it in the back of the closet and win a couple of inches back. Now one person did point out that if you have a very small car, you can actually put the semi-truss design upright in the passenger seat, say in the back seat, and be able to carry other people. That's a reason to get one of these. Another issue with the semi-truss design is its setup time. Where I showed you before, the regular solid tube dob can be set up in a minute or two. Now you're fiddling with things, extending truss tubes and putting shrouds on, and you have to do the same thing in reverse. It's not a lot of time, but if you add up all the number of times you're taking the telescope out, it does start to add to your observing time. Another minor thing to notice is you have one dust cap here on the solid tube. You have three dust caps on the semi-truss design. One on the Brocker box itself, one on the upper truss, and then there's the shroud that you have to put on it. And depending on where you buy it and who you buy it from, sometimes they actually make you pay extra for the shroud. So again, those semi-truss designs are fine. I recommend them, but I recommend them mainly because I don't find anything particularly wrong with them as opposed to having some killer feature that I have to have. Okay, I often get asked, what is the difference in brightness levels between a six and eight and a 10 and so forth? And I'm very often reluctant to show diagrams like this because what you see probably will be at least a little bit different than what I show. See, the problem is what you see through the eyepiece is not only dependent on the telescope itself, it's dependent on where you happen to live. 
If you're observing from the middle of a city, you may not be able to see anything at all. I know people who live, for example, in the middle of New York City. Those observers tend to get very good at looking at the Moon, Jupiter, and Saturn. Not surprising, those are the three objects that can burn through the light pollution the easiest. On the other hand, if you live out in the country away from anything, you may be able to see more than what I'm about to show you. So let's go ahead and show these diagrams here, the difference between the 4.5, the 6, the 8, and the 10. And you'll notice there isn't exactly an on-off switch where things suddenly pop into view. Things get a little bit brighter. Now notice also the gains get smaller as you go up the size range. From the 4.5 to the 6, that's 100% gain in light gathering ability. Okay, that's pretty significant. The 6 to the 8, yes, that's pretty good too. But you notice as you move up the aperture range, the gains get a little bit smaller. So we do find the 6 inch, the 8 inch, and the 10 inch sit in that sweet spot in terms of price versus light gathering ability. So just out of curiosity, I sent a poll question out to our club, and it said, an 8 inch or 10 inch Dobsonian is often considered an ideal beginner's telescope. Which one would you prefer, the 8 or the 10? These are your only choices. These are the results that came back, and as you can see, in at least our club, the balance is tilted towards the 8-inch. Okay, so there you have it. A look at an 8-inch versus a 10-inch Dobsonian. I would still steer most of you towards the 8-inch model, but as always, the choice is yours. I hope this video has given you enough information to decide which one of these might be right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.